Uh, so again, thanks everybody for coming. I'm Ash Oro. I am an engineer by training and I fell in love with economics about 10 years ago. I was uh, really big into politics for a while, uh, Ron Paul specifically, and I found Austrian economics and it blew me away. It, I started to understand how economics was deeply entrenched to personal freedom and individual liberty. And I really fell down a rabbit hole of Austrian econ, Ludwig von Mises, Murray Rothbard, you know, the whole, the, all the guys, uh, the Mises Institute. And I really started understanding what, what is free market economics? What is capitalism? What is this stuff? And do we have it? What's the role of does money play in your individual life? And if you have control or don't have control over your money, how does that affect your ability to be free as an individual? And that's a bit of my background. Um, I used to listen to a podcast called the, uh, the Peter Schiff Show uh, every day for about five years. And that's where I really learned economics um, personally, I would say. And back in 2012, I left my engineering job of seven years. I was a, a programmer and product manager and customer support. And I moved to the Caribbean to help build an offshore bank called Europe Pacific Bank. And I actually moved for a commission only position as a sales guy. I didn't realize that I was the first person that they ever hired at the bank. And so I got into this bank in the Caribbean as their, their first private banker and nothing had been built yet. No systems whatsoever. We barely had a website. We had a couple dozen clients and I found out very quickly that I was going to be responsible for either building out the systems, the processes, learning how to hire, learning how to train, learning how to manage. I'd never managed a team before, especially a remote team in my life. But since I was a systems engineer, I thought that I could figure it out, put the pieces together and kind of just hack my way through this. Up to that point, I wouldn't have considered myself an entrepreneur and it, there's, in my experience, it's the only experience I have, but there was no quicker way to become an entrepreneur than to do it on commission only because it really simulated building your own business where nobody's paying you. So even though I was building someone else's offshore bank, I wasn't getting paid. And so I had that burn, you know, I had that incentive to try to figure out how do you build a compliance department? How do you build a sales department? How do you build a customer service department? Uh, you know, how do you build operations? And how do you not only hire the people to support you, but put the systems in place, a CRM system, you know, a, a core banking software and learning how the SWIFT system works and how, how do you send an international wire? And how do you open up a bank account with all the KYC and the AML and international standards? So that, that's a bit about my background. I left the bank, it's called Euro-Pacific Bank. It's um, the only libertarian bank in the world. We're backed by gold and silver. And so I thought that whenever, one of the main reasons that I left, I mean, that I joined the bank was that I was going to change the banking industry from the inside out, right? It, I fell in love with economics in 2007, eight, nine, 10, right when we were going through that crash. And I was like, I lost 50% of my 401k. And I was a young guy back then, you know, my mid mid twenties or so, let's say I'm 35 now. Yeah, I was about 25 now back then. And I promised myself that I would never get fleeced like that by the banks and by Wall Street ever again. And that's what prompted me into um, understanding gold and silver as free market money, free market alternatives to government fiat. I learned what fiat money was and I learned, you know, what inflation was and why the gut, why does the government have a monopoly on the creation of money? And so it really got me thinking, oh, if we could only help people understand gold and silver, they could save their wealth in a currency that the government could not debase, right? And the problem with that was that nobody accepts gold and silver and it's very difficult to ship gold and silver throughout the world. It's not very liquid. And people are like, oh, okay, well, an ounce of gold back then was worth about $1,700. You could just put a couple ounces of gold in your pocket or you could put 10 or 20 or 30 or 100 ounces of gold in your backpack and travel the world and there you go. But I don't know the last time you guys have been to an airport, but they have metal detectors and as I call them, precious metals detectors. They don't want you traveling with money with real money, right, or any money. But so whenever Bitcoin came out, I, as a lot of gold and silver bugs or gold and silver people tend to do, we dismiss everything we see that's not gold and silver. 
And so when I learned about Bitcoin in 2011, I was like, ah, funny internet magic money. You know, it's not tried and true. Did the Romans use Bitcoin? No, the Romans used gold. You could buy togas in a mill for an ounce of gold back then, and you can still do it today. <laughs> so I dismissed it. And it wasn't until 2013 that I really found that Bitcoin was generated or created with the same properties as gold and silver, and that's what really got my interest. While I was at the bank, the thing that we tried to do is we had a gold and silver backed debit card, and we rolled out the world's first gold and silver backed debit card so that you could store your wealth in real money, gold and silver money, and then you could swipe it and spend it anywhere that MasterCard was accepted. And so it solved a big problem. And this was, this was right whenever cryptocurrencies are coming out. It solved the liquidity problem and the convenience problem. So now you could travel around the world, you could have your 10 ounces of gold and silver in your bank account, and then you could swipe your card and we would instantly convert gold or silver into whatever currency you needed around the world. And it was really convenient. But what we found was people wouldn't, people wouldn't spend their gold and silver, they preferred to spend the government money that continually lost value. And the reason that it lost value, of course, is because the governments inflate the currency supply. They're printing new money every single day. And so I was in the camp that inflation is evil. Straight up, inflation is bad, and we don't want inflation. And now that the cur no government currency in the world is backed by gold, then the governments are free to print as much as they want or as much as they're allowed to get away with. And so inflation to me was always the enemy. It was always the thing that stole from us. It was always the hidden tax that nobody really understood. Because what happens when $100 used to buy you, know, you and four of your friends dinner and drinks one night, and then $100 buys you and your date dinner and drinks one night? Well, then what happens when $100 won't even buy you dinner and drinks one night? Well, this is a hidden tax called inflation that, of course, we're not taught. I would say the past 18 months for me have really changed my opinion on what inflation is. And the differences between force-based mandatory inflation that you're locked into a system and you're not allowed to get out of, AKA for the most part, all of our government's monetary systems versus voluntary inflation that you can opt in or you can opt out of. And that's what I'd really like to focus down in today. Before I get into it, um, I want this to be, you can see I, didn't have, I don't have any slides, I, I don't have any notes, you know, this is just all from experience and from my memory and stuff that I feel like I have perspective and experience that I can share with you guys. At any time you have a question or you want to chime in, just raise your hand and I'd love to, you know, host that dialogue. So inflation, who has a definition of inflation? You do, Gary. <laughs> well, I have two. Okay. One, one is uh, inflation of the prices, the consumer prices. Like you go to the store and look at it as $2 uh, today and $4 tomorrow. That's consumer price inflation. Right. But there's also the inflation of the money supply itself. Right. Right. Yeah, and I would say that most people, especially people that went to uh, public schools, even economists that went to any university would consider inflation to be an overall or general rise in prices. Right? It's like bread, the price of bread goes up, the price of gas goes up, petrol goes up, that's inflation. But I beg to differ. I beg to argue a different stance. Inflation is the, like Gary said, the inflating of the money supply. If you have more of something, then it only makes sense that the value of that something would become less, right? If you have this much, if you have this much money, then prices are going to react to an economy that has this much money. If you have this much money, it only makes sense understanding just basic supply and demand that goods and services would have to adjust their prices 
to counteract the increase in the money supply. So just like you inflate a balloon, you're putting more air into the balloon. When you inflate a currency, you're putting more currency into the system. The rise in prices is an effect of more money being available and sloshing around. So whenever I say inflation, I mean the expansion of the money supply or adding money into the system, okay? Yes? Yeah, so the comment, just for the record, was, um, you know, the government, like the U.S. government's $20 trillion in debt. Why don't they just print that $20 trillion and pay off all their debt and then just be debt-free, right? Yeah, and this is interesting because, so currency is created out of debt, right, through bonds and debt notes, stuff like that. But if they just printed up a whole bunch of money and paid everyone out, then it would lose the confidence of the money and then there would be a run on the government's money. So they, people would start noticing like, oh my gosh, the government just printed $20 trillion. Like we know our money is gonna become less and less valuable as it sloshes around in the system and prices react and go up. I need to spend my money now before it's too late, before it's devalued to the point that $10,000 used to buy a car, you know, and now it, it buys a couple loaves of bread. And yeah, we saw that in the Weimar Republic between the, between the world wars. We also see this in a lot of countries like Venezuela, you know, Argentina. I mean, look at the crappy currency of this country, right? Ten, 100,000 rupiah or whatever's worth like seven US. I mean, man, they don't, they're gonna have to chop off zeros. And this is what happens, right? Prices try to bring e equilibrium to the, how much money is in circulation. And over time, governments either go back on the gold standard or they just say, hey, redeem your notes and we're going to issue you new notes that have the zeros knocked off. You even see it on your menus here. Instead of 75,000 you know, IDR, they just say 75 because it's becoming an inconvenience. Over time, the Indonesian government will most likely chop off three zeros just to try to make their currency look stronger than what it actually is. But the, so we currently live in a system and we're moving out of it now, but we currently live in a government controlled monopoly on money. They're the ones that print it. They force you to pay your taxes in it. And so everyone for the most part uses it as their unit of account, right? If you're forced into a system, it makes a lot of sense to use that currency to run your day-to-day -day life because at the end of the day, you have to pay that money back to the government in taxes or they come kidnap you and haul you off into jail. So it makes a lot of sense. You're incentivized to use the currency that's being inflated even if you're getting some of the purchasing power stolen away from you by the printing press that they continue to print. Now, you know, they've made it very difficult to use gold and silver and stuff like that because they don't want competition in their money. If you could create a good and have a monopoly on it, that's awesome, right? But in the free market, you have to create such a good and you have to do such a good job that you can outcompete everyone. But imagine if you had a monopoly on money, you'd probably print as much as you want. I know if Johnny had a printing press in his basement, he would just sit there printing money all day and not work. And, and I would too. But now we've got, we've got our own money. We've got cryptocurrencies. They're hidden in the cloud. They can't be picked up by uh, metal detectors, right? They don't, they're not on our person. Nobody really knows how much we have. We can send it for almost free and instantly. So now as digital communities, we have a money that can support us, finally. We have an option that we don't have to use their money. But what does this mean? Does this mean that we don't want inflation? Well, in historically, inflation, since we've been locked into a system, we've had no option to opt out of that system. If they wanted to print more money, it was going to directly cause a decrease in the value or purchasing power of our money. But now we can opt in and out of various monies, be it Bitcoin, be it Dash, be it uh, you know, Litecoin, 
Ripple for whatever reason, right? We, we can opt in and out of these currencies now. And some currencies have inflation, like Bitcoin currently is, I don't know, 7% inflation or something. It's dropping every year. Um, Augur, you know, their rep token was 100% mined and given out by their, uh, their crowd sell back in 2014. So they have zero inflation. So we're entering in to a time where peop anyone can create money. Anybody can create money. And I, I created a coin on the Waves platform just to see if I could do it. And I gave a bunch of it away and nobody ever cared and it didn't have any value. So I just stopped using it. Just because you can create money doesn't mean it's worth anything, right? So now we're in this environment where anyone can create money. They can set the rules of that money cryptographically and they can set an open and transparent inflation rate for that money to try to incentivize you to come in to their community or to warn you like, hey, we have a 100% a inflation rate every year. And you're like, no, nah, that's a little bit too much inflation. I don't trust that my money is going to retain its value with 100%. And this is this is really changed the incentive structure of cryptocurrencies and the communities. And the first time I learned about this was with Dash. Has anyone not heard of Dash? Okay, just a couple, cool. So Dash is uh, similar to Bitcoin. It was basically like a fork or a clone of Bitcoin. And a couple changes in the code were, were created before they launched the Dash currency. And whereas in Bitcoin, who gets all the inflation or who gets all the new coins mined in Bitcoin? Yeah, one person, the miners, right? And so there's inflation, it's voluntary because you're not forced into the Bitcoin system. But if you enter into the Bitcoin system, all the new money that gets printed or gets mined goes to the miners. In the US government system, all the new money that gets mined or created goes to their friends, people in the various industries, banking, you know, Wall Street, the military industrial complex, stuff like that. Those are the people who get the money first. Well, in Bitcoin, the miners get the money first. It leaves us holders kind of out of luck. In Dash, the cool thing that Dash did was they d divvied up who got, their, uh, who got their inflation. Three different types of people. One was the miners, just like in Bitcoin. 45% of the inflation, new, new coins mine, went to the miners. 45% went to this thing called masternodes, all right? And what masternodes were, has anybody heard of masternodes? Okay. Masternodes were this interesting concept that Dash uh, introduced where if you had a thousand Dash, you could lock it up in a wallet and you turned yourself in, instead of a normal wallet, into a masternode wallet. And what that did was that allowed you voting rights on the network. Whereas in Bitcoin, if you want to change the code, you basically have to beg the miners to change the code. Well, in Dash, you can send around proposals on their network and everyone with a masternode, basically they own property in the Dash network. They've shown that they're going to put their capital in this community and they lock it up, right? You lock up your coins and that gives you voting rights. Similar to how the United States initially required only landowners to be able to vote. You got to show that you have commitment to this community before they allow you to vote and change the community, right? So in Dash, you lock up a thousand Dash and then all of a sudden you get voting rights. But not only voting rights, you get paid out part of the inflation. 45% of the inflation in Dash goes paid out to the miners, but then 45% gets paid out to the masternodes. Basically, the people in the community who are like, hey, I'm, I want to dig my heels in here and be part of this community. So you can see that incentivizes people to like start communicating and start debating some of these topics and start thinking about, hey, uh, this proposal, well, I don't think it's going to be good for Dash, right? Or this proposal, I think a new GUI wallet is going to be great for Dash. Like, I vote yes on that one. I vote no on that one. What's really interesting is 10% of the inflation goes in a treasury. And anybody in the world can make um, appeals to this treasury right in, basically, and say, like, for instance, I have a podcast, Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast. I could say, I want Dash to sponsor my podcast. I would write in a treasury proposal. It would be received and passed around the network. And I would have to get enough upvotes, enough yeses from the masternodes to get funded. 
and I would get funded out of that 10% inflation that's dedicated to the Dash Treasury, right? Just think about how that could, yes, Silas. And you don't, to, to do that, you don't have to be a coin holder at all. Yeah, no. I don't have to be a master hold, um, uh, a master node. I don't even have to own any Dash. I don't have to own any Dash. I don't have to own any cryptocurrencies. Uh, okay, right. You do have to put. You, you would have you would have to put some up, but it's not much. I mean, <laughs> it, 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 but you don't have to like put up one Dash or. <laughs> um, you do need a Dash wallet, of course, because you would get paid out, obviously, in Dash, which is the inflation. So you can, you can see how this creates a bit of a community aspect. Not only are people incentivized to like pay attention to the community and vote up or vote down things, but also incentivizes people to like, it incentivizes the community to be able to host their own um, conferences, for instance. You know, they, the Dash community has funded themselves out of the voluntary inflation that they have access to, to go and network with various universities and try to set up um, partnerships where they can come in and teach cryptocurrency educational courses and stuff like that, specifically about Dash most likely. Yeah. Yeah, and they get, they can like get pizzas and drinks and like you can say like, hey, I want to support this and like you'll get 10 dash and all of a sudden you've thrown a meetup that you can bring people together and buy them all pizza and stuff. With Bitcoin, you can't do that. You know, you'd have to like say, hey, you know, you'd have to reach out to the community and convince them. But then that's people giving their money to you for a cause and maybe they will, maybe they won't. But in Dash, this money is created specifically to go out for like community outreach and community support. Yeah, they have an inflation rate very similar to Bitcoin. So, and I don't know what it is exactly, but it, one day it'll go like to almost nothing. Like, but, but hopefully, we, I mean, that, that's, that's the idea. I mean, they're going to always have inflation because it's for the treasury, but maybe it goes down. And I can't remember. I'd have to maybe, maybe Reiki knows. But, um, Yeah, and, and that's interesting because I don't know what happens to the um, treasury whenever that goes, right? Because then, like, how do the master notes get paid out? And how does the treasury get paid out? And I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah, they could just send around a proposal and say, yeah, yeah, true. Dash is about 500 bucks, I think. I would imagine you get that back there. I imagine that you, I imagine you get it back even if your proposal isn't approved. I would have to look that up. Okay. Maybe our. Right. Yeah, I mean, it would disincentivize miners potentially from coming in and supporting the network, right? Like, over, if it's only 45% rather than 100% like in Bitcoin, over time, that 45% could get cut really quickly. You know, I'm not a fan of proof of work blockchains either way. I think all proof of work blockchains are, and coins are over time going to pretty much disappear uh, in favor of proof of stake and specifically delegated proof of stake. But um, which takes me, I mean, I guess I'll, I'll answer any more questions about like Dash and proof of work coins before I go into Steam. Oh, I didn't answer everybody's questions. You're just being shy. Do you have a question? Trish, do you have a question? All right. So that, that's like an example of a proof of work coin that has voluntary inflation that incentivizes behaviors in their community that's not just mining. Now, 
Who has heard of Steam? Okay, so about 80%. Steam is a very interesting blockchain because it was built specifically for social media. And instead of rewarding miners, uh, now granted they had miners at the very beginning, but now it's a proof of stake system. So there are no miners in the system. And so how they, their inflation is used in multiple ways as well. Because remember, whenever inflation is voluntary, that just means that there's new money coming into your economy. It doesn't mean that it's worth anything more because you know, it is diluting the current shares of or the current money in your economy. But if everyone is okay with that, then you know, everyone is okay with that. I mean, nobody's leaving. Right? And if you disagree with how much inflation or how the inflation is being used, then you cash out and you go to something like Bitcoin that eventually is not going to have any inflation. And Steam will always have inflation. Right now it's about 9%, which is similar to Bitcoin, I think, at the moment. Over time, every 500,000 blocks or something like that, the inflation rate of Steam decreases by a quarter of 1% until it reaches a quarter of 1% and then it just stays there forever. And the reason that you're always going to have inflation on Steam is because people need, like, you get paid out for your content. Whenever you go to Steam, it's kind of like Facebook. You upvote someone, then you get, you get rewarded a part of the inflation for that period. Right? So instead of just going to miners or just going to masternodes or just going to some semi-ambiguous um, treasury in steam it's interesting because content creators content curators get paid out of the inflation and also the people that secure their network are called witnesses and they get paid out part of the inflation as well well now you see that inflation is being used very uniquely and this had never been done before um, not only in traditional social media but in the crypto space because Steam was the first blockchain-based social media platform. And now they're using inflation to incentivize their community to do a certain thing, which is create content and curate content. And by curate, I mean like comment, share, upvote, stuff like that. So I write on Steam about six or seven times every week, I would say as a, a content creator you know i'll put my podcast up there i've i've gathered a community of about 1700 followers now and i'm able they're able to thumb to upvote me and it gives me more than just a smile it actually sends cryptocurrency to my steam wallet where i can send it out and pay for things with it but not a lot of people use steam as money i can uh, t send it to an exchange and exchange it for Bitcoin or exchange it for Ethereum or exchange it for my beloved EOS or any other coin, right? And s s <laughs> the, as I wear a Bitcoin shirt, I say Bitcoin is going to be dead, but um, this, this shirt probably cost me about $2,500. Um, <laughs> it's a couple years old, but you know, so now as a content creator, I can create, I can write. Like today I wrote about Nepi, right? And about the, how do you say it, Uga Ugas or something like that. And I posted my videos and I posted my pictures and I wrote up about it because a lot of my followers are in countless countries around the world and they don't know about this. And like they get to read this stuff and they get to kind of experience it through my experience. And some people's upvotes are going to be worth nothing. A lot of people's upvotes are worth nothing. Just like in Dash, you stake your coins, you stake your Steam coins. The more coins you commit to the system, the stronger the value of your vote is, right? And so if you have 100 Steam and you commit it to the system, kind of like a masternode, your vote's going to be worth, I don't know, maybe seven cents, right? Like I think I have, like I'm on there, Ash Oro, I, I think I have like 40,000 Steam or something, and my upvote is worth about $6 right now. So if I went and upvoted somebody, that's going to give them a $6 payout in the Steam currency, but it's taken out of the inflation that comes every day. So now you're incentivizing people, not just the mine, not just the masternode, not just the... Um, have a treasury but you're incentivizing literally incentivizing people with cryptocurrencies to uh, content create and curate and steam's not even two years old yet 
and it's already cracked in the top 1,000 most popular websites in the world. So that shows you the incentivization is working. Um, you know, the top websites, of course, you know, Reddit, Google, Facebook, stuff like that. But to crack into the top 1,000 most popular websites in the world in about a year and a half really shows the power of what the incentive structure of these tokenomics can do if you really get them right. So I guess I'll stop right there and open up. What? Right. Yeah. So it, it yeah it came out you know it's just like a penny or something, and uh, I think I learned about it whenever it was probably about twenty five cents back in two thousand sixteen, and I got the CEO Ned Scott on my podcast on August of two thousand sixteen, and you know we talked about back then they had a hundred percent inflation, right a hundred percent, and they thought that they had this really neat way of like locking in the inflation so it didn't actually decrease the value of the coin but at the end of the day nobody wants 100 percent inflation because you know you you think they're it's going to go out of control so since then they kind of mimic bitcoin's inflation rate and so it it gave people uh more confidence in their token and just recently it ran up to like eight dollars i believe and then it crashed down like everything else did in the past couple of weeks womp womp and now I think it's hovering around two dollars or so. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. All, all of a sudden, you know, instead of making like twenty bucks for uh, an, epi uh, an episode, uh, a post, I was making like a hundred dollars. And I was like, wow, I, I don't even like need to run my business anymore. I can just like post on Steam every day, and I'm getting paid out when Steam was at like eight dollars, and it was amazing. And you saw like more people were signing up. There were more posts per day. There were more comments because when you comment, you give yourself an opportunity for somebody to upvote your comment because it's not just content creators that get paid out. If you're commenting on something like for me, I go and I write every day. You know, you got to keep it consistent to grow your audience. And I'll see people that like actually read my article and, and post like a thoughtful comment and I can upvote them as well. So maybe they're getting a 10 cent or a 25 cent or that six dollar upvote. And it, it, as someone who was in, you know, has, I had a podcast before Steam came out. And so I was trying to build an audience on the legacy social media systems. And I just, I couldn't get, get anywhere. And Facebook kept coming in and not showing my post to my audience and the people who liked my page. And, you know, they wanted you to buy ads. And I didn't want to buy ads because I didn't know how to run Facebook ads. And I don't care about running Facebook ads. But I wanted, to get, I wanted to build an audience. And with Steam, think about this. I can upvote people's comments who give me quality comments. And you better believe that they're coming back and, like, reading my stuff and commenting on my stuff because they can potentially get a payout. And it's, in my opinion, it's revolutionizing how you can interact and build a community, especially as a content creator or just as someone who likes to read or likes to watch videos because you can, you can offer something to them and they can offer something back to you and it doesn't come out of either one of your pockets. Whenever you upvote someone on Steam, you're basically telling the blockchain, this is how much Steam that I've dedicated to the system for now. It's called Steam Power, right? It's called Powering Up. You're locking in your Steam for a 13-week cycle. The more you power up, the more influence you have over the Steam blockchain. Well, with that influence, what does that even mean? That means that you get to tell the blockchain and direct where the new inflation goes, right? And so if you're a well on the Steam platform, your upvote could be worth $150. So when you upvote someone, you have a ton of influence over the, the direction of the, infla the Steam inflation. So you really can reward people on the platform. I'm not a well on the Steam platform, but I am... I can still like direct a little bit of the inflation, much more so than if I didn't have any steam powered up. And so I can, if I like somebody's content or I like somebody's comment specifically on one of my posts, I can reward them for it and it doesn't come out of my pocket. Think about how that changes the dynamic between content creator and like community or follower base. Yeah, so, so, all right, so the question is, is it ratioed out like the money, the new steam coming in versus how many people are getting upvoted? 
for the most part, there's X amount of steam being created every day or every week. And um, it's, it's divvied out, if you will, by, yeah, who is getting upvoted or not. And so there's like money up for grabs and it's going to be dis dispersed out um, due to how much new steam is getting created. I mean, I, I, I mean, I, th I, I th theoretically, I think so, but I don't think that's actually how it happens because there's this really interesting dynamic um, where you have voting power and kind of like a power meter. I don't know if anybody's played video games in here, but you know, like when you're running around your Zelda or something, I mean, your Link, and like you'll get hit and like you'll lose a heart, and like you have to like it'll regenerate or something. That's a bad example, but in in. <laughs> 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 Say what? Yeah, okay, like turbo in your car, right? If you're playing like Burnout Revenge or something, and you're like you're you're using you're using your you're using your turbo, and like you run out of turbo, and it has to like you have to wait for it to recharge. Well, that's what happens in Steam, right? It's called your voting power, and you upvote, 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 and you're losing power, 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 and so that means you can't just go upvote everyone for every reason, right? And over time, maybe a hundred percent when you have a hundred percent of your upvote available, my upvote would be like let's say six dollars. Then every time I vote, it decreases now. It's like 575, 550, five dollars, 425, stuff like that. So over time, you don't really have incentive to keep voting people because they're not going to get paid out anything. Um, no, so the power goes down the same. It's just the amount that each vote is worth at the various power. Um, like 60% of my vote may be worth, you know, 250. Whereas 60% of somebody with a thousand steam, 60% of theirs may be worth two cents. If you had, you know, a million steam, maybe it's still worth seventy five dollars. Yeah. Is it gaming the system or does it really kind of align like this is good content and the good content is getting rewarded? Does that happen? So so both. I mean kind of both. I mean good content can definitely be rewarded. Um, crap content, people definitely write a lot of crap content on there. Um, because you know, you can get downvoted, right? Just like you can upvote someone, you can downvote someone and take away their rewards, <laughs> right? Yeah, so there's voting bots, there's comment bots, there's re-steam or, re or retweet bots and stuff like People trying to figure out how the system works to, to grab some of that free money up, you know. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure what the equation is, but if you go to steamworld.org, then you can like and, and type in your name. You can literally see where your power bar is, and it'll tell you like you've got 17 and a half hours until you're back at 100 percent. Yeah, it recharges every 24 hours, but it only recharges like the equivalent of 10 maximum upvotes every 24 hours. So. Uh, it, it's really gamified. I, I think it's really wonderful. I would check out steamworld.org if you get a chance. And, you know, just go to steamit.com and see who's posting, who has a lot, who's making a lot of money. And go to steamworld.org and just, like, you can see every person they vote for, every dollar they're making, every person that votes for them. You know, every comment, it's, it's a very transparent blockchain. Yeah, so it's, am I incentivized to create good content, or am I incentivized to... Are you earning income from producing content? Yep, yep. Make sure you can get a little bit of Yep. And also, you're uploading people, so your community is getting bigger. Growing, right. Yeah, so of those two, yep. which one's weighted higher? Does that make sense? Like, are you just using mm. this to get a massive team and then sell some information products? Oh. Are you using this to actually create an income on Steam? Yeah, I'm actually creating income on Steam. Yeah, so to give you an idea, I mean, right now the Steam price is in the tank with everything else. At $2, I probably pull anywhere between probably about $1,500 a month at the moment. Um, you know, back when Steam was $5, I was making about four or five grand a month. And that little blip of time when Steam was $8, it was like, you know, six to $8,000 a month. I have no desire to sell these people anything. 
um, except just my free content. It's, it's kind of like I create a business and I do consider steam a business as much as a passion and hobby it is for me because I love it. But I've, you know, creating a following on steam or creating a business on steam, you don't have to sell anything to any, anyone. You just, you want their upvote and they're willing to give it to you for the most part, as long as they like what you're doing. Um, because you get paid out from the inflation, which is the, the really revolutionary thing. I mean, we've never had an ability to do a microtransactions before cryptocurrencies and we've never had the ability to do um, a, a financial like back and forth between the content creator and the community i mean typically you would like offer a t-shirt to someone or like hey great you commented 10 out of 10 days here's a coffee mug or something right but now you can send them every like some people there's even auto voters that I can use to auto vote people that I know comment on every single post so I have a couple of my fans or followers or all these words are really strange but my people my community <laughs> my, my minions no they all they consistently comment and I don't want to miss one of their comments so I had I found an auto voter at steamauto.com where anytime that they comment on one of my posts, it automatically votes them from my account and it doesn't pay them out more than one time for each post. Yeah. Yes, Trish. So I would like to address being sort of the way that you put money into currency on there. I was really excited by the delegation market. Mm. Like yeah, so the, the statement was Trish got really excited about the delegation market specifically, and this is probably because I was going ape shit whenever I met her about this delegation thing in Steam because what I found is whenever you stake your Steam and you power up your account maybe you don't want to create content maybe you just think that Steam's a good investment as a cryptocurrency but you don't want that that influence to go to waste because if you're not using it then you know that that's like half of the reason that you buy Steam is that so you can direct the inflation around the platform what you can do is you can basically lease out your steam power to someone else so the, i get the question a lot well i'm you know i'm kind of a new content creator i don't have a couple bitcoins to like get a sizable chunk of steam so that i can build my audience quickly by giving them upvotes so like wh what options do i have where for a fraction of the price that it is to buy steam you can rent steam power from someone and temporarily have control not ownership but control of their steam power and now your upvote just got increased from maybe a couple cents to a couple dollars and so and you're getting paid like um apr so annually you know 30 percent for nearly a risk-free loan because you can call it back at any time you don't have to wait for someone to pay you back because you're in control of your steam power any day you could say i'm calling back all my steam power it's going to come right back to me right the only risk that you have is the the capital appreciation or depreciation risk of the steam currency itself yeah are there any big big content creators that are new to steam or are making a living on steam where they were you know, traditionally before yeah um so the probably the largest actual media outlet is in gadget uh, a tech outlet but um, they just do it for the publicity and for the, the viewership. They decline all payouts. So there's an option to decline payouts on Steam, and they decline 100% of their payouts. Uh, they think that. Yeah, because there's so few like big media outlets on Steam right now that when one comes, it's like makes a big wave, and but they don't want to take part of the reward pool from other people so they want to get the visibility but they don't want to like take use up they don't want the inflation being directed to them they want it to stay with the smaller guys and they and they don't give like their full articles or reviews they link you back to their website as well because when they post on steam if they give away all their content and they're declining the payouts well they theoretically they're pulling viewership away from their website onto the steam website and so early on they were giving full articles and I'm sure that higher ups were like, wait, you're like eating into our traffic, you know, on our website where they make their money. Publishers are constantly looking for new ways to monetize and you know, messing around with paywalls and they they seem to be struggling. It's interesting that they would not do that. They yeah. I, at first they didn't do it. At first they accepted the payments, but then I've noticed like I was like the economy somehow or like the 
no, I mean, they're, they're I, I doubt it because there are some people that make, I mean, even at these low prices, $20,000 a month posting content on steam. You know, these are some of the bigger people, but I mean, there's a lot of people making a couple hundred dollars, a couple thousand dollars. And it's interesting because whenever somebody starts making too much money, maybe they've gotten in some upvote bot ring and they've finagled their way somehow to get just a ton of upvotes on any post that they post. It doesn't really matter what the quality is. Then people start saying that they're like stealing from the rewards pool and they're not because they're playing by, by the rules of the blockchain, but it costs you just like you would upvote someone to like direct money to them. It, it costs you like the same percentage power of your voting power of your little bar to downvote someone. So right now you're not incentivized to downvote someone and take money away from them. Cause why would you do that when you could either just upvote yourself or upvote one of your friends and direct money to them? Oh, of course, yeah, you can upvote yourself. I upvote everything that I write because it's the highest of quality. <laughs> Question, uh, how many hours do you put in about three weeks? On Steam? Yeah. Um, I would say I put in about an hour and a half a day. Yeah. I mean, it's a lot of fun. Trish will probably say more, but it's, it's a lot of fun sometimes because you're like allocating money to people. You're like, here's five cents for you, and here's 25 cents. Oh, that's a great comment. Here's 75 cents to you. I don't know. It's something, when I go back on like uh, Facebook or something, I click it, and I'm like, I'm waiting for it to like show how much I'm paying them out, and I just click it, and nothing happens, and it's like, you know, it's kind of boring. But you can choose how much weight each upvote has? Yeah, so you can choose a percentage of the weight for one vote anywhere between 1% and 100%. So maybe I can upvote you 100% and it's worth $6, or I upvote you 1% and it's worth, you know, like 16 cents or something. Okay. Yep, go ahead. That yeah, that's including the content. Yep. Yeah, so I talk about a ton of stuff. Like I wrote about Nepi today. I'll, I'll write about uh, maybe some engineering problem or like maybe my one of my developers has like a Ruby question, and maybe I'll post that and try to get people's feedback. Um, bugs on Steam. I, I point out I point out bugs on Steam all the time. Um, stuff from maybe I write about anarchy, or I write about libertarianism, or I write about gold, or I write about travel or photography. Yeah, it's literally a blog. So I've had a blog since like 1994. Five, and I've never, and I've never been consistent on it. And this is the first blog I've ever had that I've been consistent. And I write every single day. And if I miss a day, usually I write two times in one day, because it's that income, it's that incentive coming in, get paid. So, so the majority of them are have very little, maybe like a one cent vote. You know, I mean, you get a thousand. 1,700 people is what I have at the moment. I mean, there's some people that have, you know, 17,000 followers, and they'll get hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of comments and votes. But the majority of the votes, the majority of the accounts on Steam have such little Steam that they've staked into the system that their vote's not worth very much. So the majority of my votes come from, I would say, like 30 people. The majority of the money from the votes come from about 30 people. Yep. Yeah, exactly. So ju just like in Dash where you have a treasury system that you can like submit treasury proposals to, and I actually didn't know that it costs money to submit a treasury proposal. That uh, I'm, I'm going to research that after this. In Steam, there's one guy that says uh, he, he runs an account where he's planting trees in Costa Rica with all the money that he makes. And so if you care about planting trees in Costa Rica, you come and upvote this guy and he's literally like his posts are showing him like shoveling dirt and planting trees. And so it's a really neat way for you to sponsor someone that, you know, you don't know, you might not even know their real name. Yeah, so utopian.io is another account on Steam that they support um, open source programmers. So people put up there like, hey, I would like this, 
this app to be made or I want I need this type of algorithm to be written and somebody can be like I'll do it but for let's say $350 and so if your if your post gets $350 you send it to that person and then they you know they write the code for you and so it monetizes open source software which has been a problem in the open source community for a very long time with like Linux and stuff is that for the most part you know, open source code is free. You don't buy it. So how do you incentivize these people to keep writing this code? Well, with Steam, you have that. And one more example is um, there's this guy in Africa. He's in Nigeria called Ben Dollars. Of course, that's probably not his real name. But he commented, you know, he was, I, I found him one day. I don't know how. And, like, him and his entire family were, like, freaking celebrating because he made $5 on Steam, right? And, and he had, like, he cashed it out and, like, showed whatever currency is in Nigeria. I don't know what it is. But he, like, showed him, like, ca was, like waving it around. And, like, they made these signs. And, like, he showed his family, like, all jumping up and down and stuff like that. And I went through there and I found every post and every comment, like, $6, $6, $6, $6. So I like, just paid the guy. And, like, he sent me, like, the nicest little message. He's like, I can't believe that. Like, $5 for me was, like, such a big deal. And now I have, like, $55 because, like, you allocated it to me. And, like, $5 to a lot of people is a lot of money, right? In a day, a lot of people live on less than $5 a day. And so that's an amazing way that you can support people around the world without having to know who they are or check passports or, or work through the banking system. You can allocate money to these people, and it's very humanitarian. It's, it's really beautiful. Yeah. Um, I, I, go ahead. Any downside? I mean, technologically, I, th I think that there's some issues. Like, it doesn't reward high-quality content as much as I would like it to do because you basically have a seven-day pay window with Steam and you can get upvotes for seven days and after that seven day period the voting basically stops and you make the money that you made within that seven days and I don't like that because it doesn't incentivize people like me I could write some really awesome Steam articles on how to guys and stuff that would take me hours to write or I'll spend 30 minutes writing about Nepi and make the same amount Right. And so I think that's an issue with the current Steam uh, implementation is that it does kind of incentivize lower quality but more consistent content. Yeah, but, but this is just the first iteration of a blockchain-based social media platform. There's going to be multiple ones in the future. I mean, I would be very surprised if, like, Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and stuff like that didn't eventually try to integrate their own tokens. Otherwise, I mean, I, I can tell you I spend more time on Steam than pretty much all other social media combined these days because of that financial incentive that I've got. And... It's built a bigger community. And now I can't sell to most of these people because they're in Pakistan and they're in Nigeria and they're in, you know, Colombia and they're in these places where they don't have a whole lot of cash. Huh? Italy. Yeah, Italy or they're in Bali or whatever. And, and like, I, I can't sell anything to them, but it's awesome because they can still be part of my community and I don't have to feel like I need to sell anything to them because I just keep giving them content. Right, and it's on blockchain, so there's no censorship. So I can write anything I want at any time. And what's really cool is that since it's a blockchain-based social media, there's multiple websites that plug into the blockchain. So I don't, I'm not stuck with using like one specific website to write my post. So I can go to steamit.com, which is the largest, or I can go to busy.org, which is, I think, way better, and, but it's a lot smaller and unknown. There's even websites and apps that are popping up, like um, one called DTube, basically Decentralized YouTube, which they've created their website to cater only towards video. But since it's decentralized, unlike where YouTube can take off and close down your account, you can't do that with a blockchain-based social media. And so if you want to, I upload my podcast episodes now to YouTube and to DTube. One I don't get paid out on and the other I get paid out on, right? There's something called Zapple, which is a decentralized Twitter that runs on top of Steam. There's um, dmania.lol, which is uh, for memes. It's only for memes, right? It's for pictures and they have to be memes. And you can get paid out on memes, for crying out loud. There's dsound which is a decentralized SoundCloud that they only handle audio, 
right? And so this is a blockchain that was built for content, any type of content. All of those are run on top of the Steam at blockchain. Yeah, and they all have the little upvote button. And if you love memes, go to dmania.lol and maybe they're good, maybe they're not. If they're good, vote them up. If they're not, vote them down or don't vote them at all. Yeah. Yeah, the, the majority of my content, I don't publish anywhere else. It's ste Steam only. Um, I, well, first off, there's bots that run on Steam that's like plagiarism bots. You know, in, in high school, we were taught by our ridiculous public school teachers that we had to be careful of like plagiarism and all this. And we had to like double check all of our sources and cite them and everything. Well, in the real world on Steam, they're just bots that run around and like, well, Google search your content and see if, see if you stole it from anywhere. I don't want that little bot seeing like, hey, you're double posting here and here. And the only thing that I do is I've released about 80 episodes of my podcast and they're all on YouTube. Uh, so right now my team and I, we're like downloading the video and then re-uploading it to DTube so that I can get upvotes on some of that stuff. But all the rest of my content just stays on Steam. It, on Steam. So you can share some of the content that's on Steam on Facebook? Yeah, like I'll link to it, of course, like on Twitter and Facebook. No, don't don't republish it yet. Yep. Um, I've written about virtual assistants every once in a while, but we've moved to an invite-only um, service now, so I don't I don't really accept a lot of new clients. Yeah, and it is an issue though in Steam because I was talking to. I can't remember your name. I was talking to Keith the other day, and he was like, the affiliate marketing community has kind of blackballed Steam because after seven days, after you get your payout, it inserts your post into the blockchain and you can never edit it ever again, right? So you gotta be careful what you write up there because it's gonna get locked into a blockchain. And just like Bitcoin transactions are irreversible, well, once your content is written into the Steam blockchain, it's irreversible. What happens if you and your affiliate partner go bad? Or what if you're linking to a website that you don't want to link to anymore? Well, you can't jump in and edit it after seven days. So that is one issue that I have with Steam. Uh, are the economics just not right for major retail investors with their content there? Like the New Yeah. So right now the market cap of Steam is so small, I don't think that they would make enough money to actually do it. I don't think they're incentivized to the point where it makes sense for them. Because you know, if they come in, they're probably looking to make at least a couple hundred thousand dollars a month or something. So just having new users on the platform doesn't necessarily increase the price of Steam because you have to have more capital coming in. So somebody's got to be buying the Steam currency to support all the new authors. Um, over time, if the, so the Steam market cap's probably about 600, 700 billion right now. You know, if that gets up to like 70 billion, the size of like Ethereum or something, I think we would see there's going to be more, more Steam pie inflation to go around. I think we will see larger and larger publications coming over. Alternatively, I think that hopefully soon, if not on Steam, then in EOS, because uh, Dan Larimer, the creator of Steam, is also the creator of EOS which comes out June the 1st, and he plans on building, he had a bit of a falling out with the CEO of Steam, and he plans on building a Steam competitor on EOS that corrects a lot of these um, early issues that Steam experienced. You know, since when you're the first person, to, first team to do something, you're most likely gonna make mistakes, and so he's gonna correct a lot of those mistakes and create a, uh, a competitor, and we'll see where that goes. But over time, I think we will start seeing more and more publications. But first, I think we're going to see, um, I think we're going to see some smaller social media platforms start integrating tokens in their system before they start losing viewership because they think they can get paid somewhere else. But we'll see. Johnny. They already have some, like, chat. I don't know if you consider them social media. I think some of them have aspects like cacao and um, Korea and things. Yeah. Mm. There's not a
Mm. So, yeah, so it's really weak right now, and this is another issue that I think Steam has. There's a You can pay to promote, but it's not really well thought out on the platform. Now, this isn't on the blockchain level. This is on the uh, user interface level, so the website. So anyone could create a different type of advertisement model for their website on top of Steam. The only one that's really done it so far is steamit.com, and it's, it's not worth it. Um, I was just passed yesterday an article uh, on Steamit from somebody who wanted to create like uh, an advertising agency. Yes, yeah, steamrush.com. Now, I'm not affiliated. I've never used it. It's brand new. But basically what happens is there's bots that you can pay to upvote you, and the idea is the upvote you get is worth more than the amount that you paid the bot, the bot to vote you. And so he, like, does all these analytics and finds the best bots, and you pay him X dollars. He basically promises you more than X dollars back because he can find people who are going to upvote you and allocate, you know, the steam to you, and that's and he takes the margin in between. You know, and there's forks and clones of steam. One. Uh, a Russian team decided that they wanted to fork Steam um, and called Golos, G-O-L-O-S, and, and cater specifically to the Russian community. There's people doing the same thing in Korea. And so we're, we're starting because everyone, for the most part, just hangs out on Steam right now because it was the only blockchain. But now what we're seeing is the idea is starting to get in people's mind that, oh, I want... I want to have my own blockchain for social media, but most importantly, they want control over the inflation of that blockchain, right? Because remember, if you can print money, most likely you're going to do it. Yes. I mean, yeah, so we talked about Dash, um, Steam. EOS is a very interesting. We're already in an hour, so I'm going to keep this really short. Um, Whereas, whereas with like Ethereum and Bitcoin only pay miners, you know, Dash pays their masternodes and treasury, Steam pays content curators and creators. Um, EOS is very interesting because it has created, and it's not out yet, so this is only on paper, but they have created an inflationary system where the entrepreneurs get paid out. So basically, I'll give one quick example. Let's say that someone has a wallet on EOS and you really like it and you want to use it. Well, what you do is you stake some of your coins with them, and that gives you access to the wallet. It doesn't mean that they, they, they can't take those coins. They don't, you know, you're not passing those coins to them, but you're staking those coins with their service. And now the new inflation, when it comes out in the EOS platform, it looks around and it's, the inflation basically says, who has coins staked with them, and I'm going to pay them out from the new inflation. All right, and so let's say you have a file hosting service on EOS, and people stake EOS tokens with you to get access to your file server, ser your your file storage service. Well, the more coins you have staked with you, then the m more inflation that gets directed your way. Whenever you no longer want that file storage, then you delete all your files. You call back the stake tokens that you have from that service, and then they lose the inflation that's associated with the tokens that you staked with them. And I really like this model. As an entrepreneur, I looked around at these blockchains, and I didn't see the people who are building being incentivized to build directly from the inflation that comes out. Right? They're always like trying to get someone to pay them something. But now with EOS, and this is what's revolutionary with EOS, is that you can stake your coins with someone else for a good or, or not a good but for a service and you're basically saying hey blockchain pay this person out because i i'm using their service and so the inflation goes straight to the companies who are building on eos and supporting the network and incentivizing people to build services that people want rather than just mine gary <laughs> oh. I've completely changed my mind about inflation now, and th this is this is a great wrap up. Thank you, Gary. That's a nice little one of these. 
You know, I used to think inflation sucked and it was terrible, but that's only because it was non-voluntary. Whenever inflation is voluntary and you can opt in or opt out, you can do amazing things with it. You can incentivize things. Maybe you incentivize something that somebody doesn't care about and they're not a part of your community. Or maybe you're incentivizing something that they love and they think it's great and they think it's going to grow the community and attract more capital in. And even with inflation, the price of a token can go up because the capital coming into that economy is greater than the, the value of the new coins being created. right? And so I really appreciate inflation because of now, since we have the ability to print our own money or mine or coin our own money, we can opt in and opt out and, and like take care of each other, take care of that guy in Nigeria with inflation who five bucks literally means pictures of him and his family jumping up and down and partying. So if you wanna learn more about this, um, check out Dan Larimer. He created uh, both Steam and and uh, EOS. Um, I've, I've read uh, the majority of the articles that he's written and this is where I've broken away from the Mises Institute for instance uh, because they are ba they basically say that inflation is bad pretty much all the time but they couldn't comprehend a, a financial economic environment where we could control the inflation it was always they could control the inflation so whenever you're looking at blockchain uh, blockchain projects take a look at how much inflation is being printed and where it's going and who it's incentivizing. And for me, there's no better project than EOS because it incentivizes builders and entrepreneurs. So uh, yeah, any questions, that's all I got guys, thank you. Yeah, maybe. Well, you know, fiat works for the people that print fiat. You know, fiat, fiat inflation works for the community that's being built around the people that print the fiat. So you see the medical complex, you see the military industrial complex, right? You, you see all of these communities that the government uses their inflation to support. Um, we've just never been able to support our communities with inflation before because we were the ones paying for the support that they were giving their friends. So finally, we can do our inflation to pay our friends and ourselves now without, you know, just pay, holding the bag the whole time. Yep. Right. So the, the question is, like, couldn't somebody try to, like, is it, like, change the inflation to scam people or? Yeah, anyway, I, if I yeah. manipulate free rate to try and create coins. Right. Uh, sure. Yeah, oh, for sure. Really yeah, ab absolutely. Yeah, so I think you need to look at how much inflation that coin's going to have. Like, you need to look in their white paper. And then hopefully once they launch their blockchain, you can measure the amount of inflation that's happening. And maybe you can't individually, but there would be like teams or people or researchers that will. Uh, the other thing is, where's their inflation going? Is, does it say like, hey, we're going to do 10% inflation. Maybe they do 10% inflation, but 90% of that inflation goes to the team, right? And so you got to watch out for stuff like that. Uh, the cool thing about projects that are community driven, so it like Steam and like EOS will be, is that anybody that stakes their coins gets voting rights, right? And so you're basically, it's, it's kind of like proving that you bought land in, in a neighborhood and now you're part of the homeowners association. You get voting rights because you're part of that community. The more Steam you hold or the more EOS you hold, then the more influential your votes are whenever something gets brought up. And, and for instance, in EOS, uh, the inflation rate through their constitution can never be more than 5% per year once the blockchain's launched, but it can be as little as 0% per year. And you basically bring it up as a community for a vote. And if you have 
let's say 10 EOS, your vote is worth 10. If you have 1,000 EOS, your vote is worth 1,000, et cetera. And you get to vote on what you think the inflation rate should be. And if you don't like it, cash out and go join a community with a better inflation rate or, or inflation payout. Yeah. But this is way better than Bitcoin or Ethereum, which is proof of work, because you have no influence over what the inflation is, and you have no influence over who gets paid out the inflation. So central bankers justify inflation in the old system because <laughs> they, they claim that you know, there's new economic activity, and we have to create money for that new economic activity so that it can take place. And they also claim to destroy money when, the, when it comes back to them and when the economy contracts. Essentially planning everything. Right, right. Yeah. Um, and uh, that, I mean, that makes that makes logical sense. On certain, I mean, I don't think that's. I think they use that as an excuse. You know, I have my political opinions, but this, that's their logical um, justification for doing that. And uh, I'm wondering if there's any, if you feel like the economics have reached their equilibrium, so that like that six dollar upvote is that. Do you think that's really worth six dollars, mm -hmm. or is it because of the the economics of the coin, and we're, we're booming in these ICO mm -hmm. markets, and like, doesn't that have to actually be worth six dollars, or there's some sort of distortion taking place as it grows and finds equilibrium in a broader economy? Yeah, I mean, we're definitely still very much in the price discovery right now for all crypto tokens. So. Are the posts that I make, I think I make about $30 a post right now when Steam's at two bucks. Are my posts worth $30? I mean, I think so. I think they're worth $50. But maybe they're not, right? Maybe they're worth like $5. But, you know, over time, the price of Steam is either going to go up or go down. And I'm going to realize that real price of the quality of my content, or at least what people are willing to pay for it. But that's interesting because they're not paying for it. Right. They're just allocating the new steam. And so it's really interesting. And one more thing, whenever you see Bitcoin's market cap is like, let's say, two hundred billion dollars. Well, two hundred billion dollars hasn't actually gone into Bitcoin because a lot of the people who have Bitcoin aren't selling Bitcoin. Right. So they take that Bitcoin off the books. So if you go on an exchange and you have, let's say, $100 million that you want to buy new Bitcoin with, well, the price of Bitcoin, the market cap of Bitcoin is going to go up way more than $100 million because you're not, uh, you have a small float of that Bitcoin. So you're not affecting the price. You don't have the entire pool of Bitcoin that you're affecting the price. It's only a small percentage of Bitcoin that's available that you're changing it up and down. So I think that, you know, and this, this isn't uncommon to stocks either. It's just stocks are way more liquid. So $100 million would move uh, like an Apple stock a lot less. But you can move. Th that's why we see crypto is so volatile, because we think that it has these big market caps. But in actuality, um, if people really tried to start selling and realizing that market cap, it would drop quite fast. And that's why we have dips like we have in the past six weeks. Uh, somebody had their hand up. so little like about 
about the, the real demand, the real, like, you know, so few people are using these things yet. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, just remember, uh, don't fall into the sunk cost fallacy, meaning that the amount or the price of electricity used to create one Bitcoin does not increase or affect the value of that Bitcoin. It's still just supply and demand. It doesn't matter how much electricity or the price of electricity that goes into building something. It, that really doesn't have any effect of the value. But like with EOS, you, there's just inflation and it gets divvied out. And so there's no work that has to be put in, but it doesn't mean that the coin doesn't have value. It, all the values derived subjectively. It doesn't really matter what the inputs are though. Yeah. So if, yes, yeah, so it's, yeah, it does dilute people and how it wouldn't dilute anyone with new inflation is if additional capital was coming in. So if it did, yes, right, exactly. And, and that's what we're playing with right now. Right. Bottles of champagne. There's also there's also utility on Steam that you can send um, for free around the world. So you can send currency to someone in three seconds at no cost. So, you know, that, that compares, yeah, it's, it makes a great currency. Uh, there was somebody over here, yeah. So out of your units of computer time or work time, 2018, you're spending an hour and a half a day on the team's platform. Do you think per day that is worth an hour and a half of efficient time in your work? Out of all your emails, what's going on in the crypto space? Yep. Um, I mainly did it for educational purposes. If, if I didn't study STEAM to the extent that I did, I wouldn't have known about EOS, and I wouldn't have been able to understand the, the world that EOS is opening up, uh, both blockchain-wise, development-wise, um, how they're doing their resources, how they manage their voting, um, how they just, I, I wouldn't have understood the technology of delegated proof of stake if I didn't fall into steam. And I figure if I was studying this for months on end, I might as well write and just see what that's like. See if I was able to grow following again as a podcaster, I, you know, I have like a thousand followers on my Facebook page after two and a half years. And now I've been active on steam. I would say every day for about four, five months now. So maybe six months, I'll say six months. since about September last year. And you know, I've, I've grown quite a bit more. Now it's a different quality of community that I've built because my podcast typically has, you know, digital entrepreneurs and on steam, it's going to have, you know, all sorts of people and the comments are crazy. And I don't know if they're bots sometimes. And like, I'll be like, you're a bot, aren't you? And they never reply, which means yes. But it, it, it helped me under using it's an issue with blockchain teams and projects is most blockchain projects don't have a usable product. Almost none of them have a usable product. You know, the unwritten rule of Ethereum is you can build on Ethereum, but you can't release on it because they can only support 25 or 30 transactions per second. Steam does almost 2 million transactions every single day, right? It, it does more than 50% of all the on-chain blockchain transactions in the world. So it, and you can check this blocktivity.info, blocktivity.info. Steam, the Steam blockchain does more blockchain transactions than every other blockchain combined at the moment. How, what, how large in like gigs? I'm not sure. I'm not sure how big. They store the actual content on the blockchain. Yeah.
understand yeah. how this concept would work on a platform. And th there's, there's hundreds of people that have written bots and dApps and projects on Steam and actually released them and they're usable. Whereas on any other blockchain, I don't really know, honestly, of very many projects that have been released that you can even use yet. And if you go over to Steam, there's steamtools.com, and it'll have dozens and dozens and dozens of people, like bots and apps and stuff like that, that people have released. So, and that's because they can support 100,000 transactions per second, where Bitcoin can support seven, and Ethereum can support 25 to 30. That's a big difference there. You could run, and to give you an idea, reddit.com, you know, the, the front page of the internet, they require two to 300 transactions per second, and Steam can already do easily 50 up to 100,000 transactions per second. So it could run the entire internet right now. Google, I mean, maybe not, Bi maybe not like Chinese internet with Baidu and stuff, but like Google only requires like, I think it's like 30,000 transactions per minute, I believe. Somebody would have to fact check me there. But we, the Steam blockchain could run Google and Facebook and Twitter and everything, if, if transactions-wise. So apparently this blockchain is huge. There's all the content stored on it. So who's actually like maintaining nodes? Like who's getting incentivized to do that? And how is it centralized, I guess? Yeah, so it's, they're called witnesses. Uh, you can think of them kind of like a miner. It's different because it's proof of stake rather than proof of work. But part of the steam inflation goes and pays the witnesses as well. I think there's 21 witnesses. So around the world, there's 21 different people that verify the information before it goes into a block. And you think only 21, only, only 21 people. Well, think about this. Ethereum, um, about three miners control more than 50% of the Ethereum hash rate. And so 50% of the time, it's one of three mining teams that basically write the new content into the, the Ethereum block. And same for Bitcoin, about four, maybe five miners control about 60% of all the Bitcoin transactions and writing them into the block. So when you compare it to that, 21, all evenly distributed in 21 pieces is a lot more decentralized. Yeah, and they're voted in and voted out. Yeah, so basically you have to show yourself as part of the community and you have to start building your following and you have most of the time you write free software and build free tools for the community to use and release it all open source so that people can start building trust in you. And then everyone gets a vote on Steemit for who the witnesses will be. And, you know, maybe after we really release our bot, you know, the Steam Smarter bot, maybe we'll start trying to create a campaign to be a witness. And there's about 50 or 60 people that are, have open campaigns to be a witness, but only the top 21 are actually the validators of the block and get paid out. So you can get voted out as well? For sure. Yeah. It's, the the it's the holders of the coins that get to do the voting. Basically the property holders of the blockchain, yeah. Do you have to have a certain amount of steam to be eligible to be a witness? Uh, no, you don't, okay. yeah. You can get, I mean, most of them are going to have quite a bit of steam because they've been in the community for a while. They've been, they've built apps on the community. You know, like the guy that, or the team that built DTube, for instance, or DSound, or the, the team that built um, steamworld.org, which is like a really awesome user interface uh, for steam. Those are the types of people that have the authority or have the credibility to run as a witness. Uh, I don't think so. Maybe I'm not a witness, so I, I, I can ask them. Maybe I'll uh, maybe I'll blog about that tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah, I think that was mainly, uh, of course, that was because he got called out for. There's some allegations, and I don't know Brock personally. I've actually never met him, but I think that it was a like a, a politically correct thing that. Block One wanted to do. I think he was in the virtual space long before virtual currencies ever existed. I think he is a quite a bit of a visionary in the space, and it's really too bad that um, that little sock puppet, the Late Show or whatever the hell that was last night, tonight, or some dumb name, had to do a, a hit piece on him basically because Block One definitely lost a, a true inspirational and like guy in Brock. That was why they got rid of yeah, most likely. All right. All 
All right. Anybody else? Yes. Well, not quite six billion dollars, is it? Okay, well, yeah, it, it's a lot of money, though. Yeah. No, I think. Yeah. So what what they're doing? I, a little birdie told me um, that what they're doing with a lot of the money is, you know, they created that venture capital fund with a billion dollars of it, but they're also going around to various teams who either have built on Ethereum who are thinking about building on Ethereum and basically offering to buy a block of their tokens and say like, hey, you want to raise $50 million? Well, we'll buy $20 million of your token sell. Just take it off the market. We'll buy it. And then they're going to airdrop it on the Genesis block of EOS to try to give the, the EOS community tokens for this project to incentivize that project to build on EOS. And so they're funding a lot of development They've got a massive team. I think one of the interesting projects they're doing is if you want to write or develop on Ethereum, you use this slightly obscure programming language called Solidity. Uh, EOS uses something called WebAssembly, but also C++ and some more common um, programming languages. They're building compilers so that people can compile their Solidity code down into WebAssembly so it's super easy to run your Ethereum-based project and port it over to EOS. So super smart. Well, they've got a lot to dump, that's for sure. Is it, isn't that? <laughs> well, I, I, w I can't disclose one. I mean, I'm sure people have heard of, um, it's called Ever Everpedia, who basically got 100% of their token sale bought up by EOS, and they're dumping 100% of their tokens on the Genesis block. So you can't even buy the Everpedia token. It's basically a Wikipedia competitor that has blockchain payouts, kind of like Steam. So it incentivizes various things. And so as an EOS holder, you're going to get some free Everpedia tokens on as soon as the blockchain is released. All right. Thank you, everyone.